Thank you very much. Am I on? Yes. I was told I can remove my mask. I hope I can do it properly. Oh, it's got stuck here somewhere. Ah. Anyway. Well, since I can remove my mask, I'm glad that today, this morning, I, I agreed to, uh, I decided to shave and to trim my moustache. <laughs> you know how it is with, just pull it down. Forward. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jehu. <laughs> yes, it's a real relief actually to be able to open my mask and speak to you <laughs> and to come fully dressed. <laughs> you know how it is in Zoom, yeah? You can go into your meeting, your webinar, half-dressed, <laughs> just the top half. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, life has changed, life has changed. And we adjust. We got to adjust and uh, we thank God for the opportunities that we have to use the modern technology today. Uh, it has been quite an adjustment for somebody like me who has lived more than seven decades in this life. <laughs> and uh, uh, somebody, my friend, in a WhatsApp message and said, we are a very fortunate generation. I said, why? You know, we live through so much. So much. Some of us live, even lived through the Second World War. But I, I, I said, no, I decided to wait until the war is over, then I come out. <laughs> we need a little bit of wisdom now and then. <laughs> anyway, he said, you know, we, 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 we used to have a telephone where we had to go and knock the, 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 the whatever you call it and say, hello, can I have number 3145? In those days, we only had four numbers on the phone. Huh? Now we have doubled that number, eight, eight digits in our phone. And from that to uh, dialing your phone and say, hello, and uh, to mobile phone. Today, I remember my first mobile phone was about this size. <laughs> With a long, long aerial. <laughs> Yeah, and it didn't go very far. It didn't connect me very far. But praise the Lord, we have lived through that, and we have lived through I don't know how many infectious pandemics or endemics, whatever you want to call it. You know, we have survived. And when we started jabbing ourselves, and we, there was a lot of confusion and discussion about why should we get vaccinated at all. Then somebody said, no, it's going to be, you know, just like the flu jab. Every year we've got to get a fresh jab. And I said, I've never had a flu jab in my life. <laughs> no flu jab at all. I never fall ill at to you. You can ask my wife, I hardly fall sick. Praise the Lord. Say, touch wood. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. Yeah. I believe our natural immunity is the best protection. God has given us that. I mean, you can outdo what God has done? No way, no way, friend. No vaccination can outdo that. All right, praise the Lord. And uh, Flo and uh, Jun Lai are living examples. <laughs> living examples. <laughs> praise the Lord. Yeah, they've overcome uh, their, their experience and God has blessed them with I think uh, uh, immunity even better than our vaccination stuff. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, let's not go into that. Uh, we have more interesting things to say, uh, to talk about to, uh, this morning. But first, I want to thank the eldership, Elder We and all the rest for this wonderful invitation. You know, when I come before CMC, I'm always like, uh, hmm, my heart beats a little bit faster. <laughs> because I know that some of the people here, yeah, some of them are, mm, you know, up there. And I said, oh, who am I to talk to these guys? Yeah, but praise the Lord for this wonderful privilege. I count it a joy. 
The last time I spoke was about three Christmases ago. So it took you three years to recover. <sighs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, we all recover sometime or other. All right. And then uh, this morning as we were dressing, my wife said, I, I, I've forgotten how to dress for church. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we hardly uh, have come to church for two years. We haven't come physically. So I persuaded my church to say, Let, let's start at least once a month. Yeah, I know CMC does it every Sunday. Praise the Lord for you. Yeah, you're a great example. If CMC can do it, so can we. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, and I thank God for this opportunity. Yeah, let's not go any further on the introduction. Except that uh, I thank God for, although, uh, Brother Jehu mentioned about, you know, missions and all that stuff, which I've been doing for, wow, since 1970, not too long ago. Huh? <laughs> but uh, uh, the last two years, three years since pandemic, I was not able to travel at all. And he mentioned about, you know, empowering and equipping churches and pastors and leaders to, to go ahead. You know, that, that, that the thing you're doing, Elder Wee, about uh, kingdom, kingdom leadership and all that is great. Really great. We need that. Yeah. And, and, and it reminded me, I've not been able to go back to India since October 2018. Not because of the pandemic. It was before the pandemic started. The great leader in that country decided that I was doing too much good. And said, please don't come anymore. So I was turned away at the immigration at Calcutta, and uh, my, na my name is blacklisted, so it's my wife's name. Yeah, so they, they wouldn't issue us a visa. But uh, I'm looking forward to that time when I can come back. Uh, I think brother, the late brother Gim Hock also had, went through the same experience with me, but finally they, they, they reinstated his status and he was able to come back. I hope that will happen. Anyway, what I was going to point out is this. When I left... India, I said, God, why? At the peak of what I'm, you have called me to do, my ministry is flourishing, we have got great crusades going, thousands comes, and hundreds and thousands of them get saved in every crusade. And we see miracles happen right before our eyes. Hundreds of people get healed instantly, just like the way Jesus was healing. You know, blind eyes open, deaf people hear again instantly. The lame walked in one of our crusades. A woman was raised from the dead. She has been dead for, hallelujah, for six hours. Yes. Give a clap to the Lord. Yes, amen. You know, they were ready to bury her in a matter of hours. You know, she was, they had bought a coffin. They had already prepared a lot for burial. And, and we said, let's pray. But because that before that, before the crusade, I, I, I don't like to use the word challenge. You don't challenge a lot. You just request. <laughs> uh, I said, Lord, I've seen so many miracles happen in my crusade that you have used me. And, and you are real. You are here. You are doing what you promised in John 14, 12. The things that I do, you shall also do. Hallelujah. And even greater things. I, I've seen so many miracles, healings of all kinds of disease, but I've not seen the dead raised from the dead. Hallelujah. And when I went to <laughs> India, the very first crusade, the Lord said, I show you. Huh? I show you huh? <laughs> that what I promise, I am faithful to keep. Hallelujah. And that was first, first night, that woman was raised from the dead. When the family were ready to bury her. Because they, not, they did not have any cold room to keep dead bodies in that village. They bury straight away after the, the, the person dies. You know, it, it was a miracle. It was a real powerful miracle that, that challenged the people. And they all believed and the faith was just raised to a fantastic level. And we saw hundreds and hundreds of people healed. And thousands were saved. And when I came back to Singapore, I, I was almost angry with God. I said, God, why? Why are you stopping all this? God, God did not answer me with why he answered. He just brought to my mind something which I never did before. 
I never did a David thing. You know what David did, huh? He counted his soldiers. Huh? <laughs> I never did that. Then the Lord said, how many crusades have you conducted? Have you ever thought how many of them were moved by my spirit to come to salvation? And I counted and I counted. I said, my God, it was nearly 40,000 in just a matter of a few years, three, four years. 40,000 souls were saved and recorded and followed up. I didn't bother. It was all God's work. Huh? All glory to Him. And He did all the follow-up. I mean, He did through the churches, of course. And the Lord said, now, step back. And from that on, time onwards, I've been hearing news about the local pastors, the local missionaries taking over. Because I said to that person who conduct, uh, who, uh, who was about to conduct the first um, uh, mission conference, uh, mission uh, evangelistic crusade, I told him, sorry, I cannot come. I've been stopped by the immigration. But I'm going to tell you the words of Jesus. The things that you have seen me do this last 13 years in India, you can also do. You can also do. Hallelujah. And I, friends, I never planned this introduction. <laughs> you can blame it on Jehu. <laughs> he brought to my mind all those wonderful things we did on mission trips. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, praise the Lord. Today we are living in exciting times, friends. What Jesus has promised is coming true. The things that I, I have seen me do, you shall do also. We can do whatever Jesus did. That's why Jesus said that even greater things than what I've done, you shall do. I said, Lord, you are Jesus. You are Son of God. I'm a human being. How can I do greater things than you? The Lord showed me. The Lord showed me. I was in one place, one man at one time. Today, there's more than one billion Christians all over the world. If they all represent Jesus, there's one billion Jesus all over the world. If they all obey the Word of God, they'll be doing exactly what Jesus did. One billion times. Hallelujah. That's what we're called to be and to do. Hallelujah. And it's been a joy for me all these years since 1970 to be involved in what God is involved because that is what He wants to do. To restore us to a position where we stand with the Lord Jesus Christ as our elder brother in the kingdom of God, sitting at the right hand of Jesus, doing the things that Jesus did. Hallelujah. Okay, be not deceived. Because today, although exciting, a lot of things are happening. A lot of confusing things are happening. Yeah. Uh, now, I must admit that this is not a fresh sermon, completely fresh sermon, which I prepared just for CMC, but it is for CMC because... When the Lord impressed upon me to speak on this, I had actually been promised by the June Lai that I would speak on something else. <laughs> but the Lord said, do this. We need to hear this. Okay, I said, okay, I'll modify it to, sit, uh, to, to suit this time. All right, so I'll have to turn on. Yes, it's on. We'll be, we're living in the end times. Whether you like it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to discuss it or not, whether you want to oppose it or not. Friends, the signs around us are so clear. The signs around us. You know, I thank God, Brother uh, We and uh, Elder We and, and all the rest of the people are talking about all these end times. In the last few months alone, I've been invited three times to speak on the end times. Series, seven, seven night series, many hours locally as well as overseas on Zoom. People are interested in this end times. People want to know a lot of things about this end times, especially on rapture. You know, how many of you want to know when you're going to be raptured? <laughs> we always want to raise our hands. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't like going through the tribulation. Do you? You enjoy hurting yourself and getting hurt? No, I, I don't. And I believe God has saved us not out to judgment, but unto salvation. And, and, and okay, so now you know where I stand. 
<laughs> so I, I spoke a lot on this about the, the timing of the rapture. I'm glad it is one of the subjects we're going to cover. Yeah, and, and so this has been interesting times, especially when we see around us COVID-19. Is this one of the pestilences that is mentioned by Jesus in, in, in Matthew 24? Is it so important that we must keep our eyes open and prepare ourselves? Yes, yes, and no. Do not be deceived. Jesus in, chapter, in verse 4 of uh, chapter 24 starts off by saying to the disciples, of all the signs, he says, take heed, let no one deceives you. Why do you say that? I mean, so many things to talk about, which would be interesting to, to us. Disasters, pestilences, famines. The disciples ask Jesus this question, tell us, when will these things be? You notice there are two things here the disciples are asking. And then they say, when will the sign of your coming be and the end of the age? They ask Jesus actually for two things. These things that will be and the sign, one sign. They ask for Jesus for one sign, but of course Jesus obliged them with many more. So let's look at the immediate context. I always believe in contextual understanding of the word. Yeah. I say this to my church many times. A verse out of context is a pretext. It's a pretension. It's not true. We must always study verses and scripture in its proper context before and after and as in the context of the whole Bible. Yeah, does it all full fit in? Okay, it, the, the immediate context is before this, the few verses before this in 23 uh, chapter 23, verses 13 to 9, 39. People very often um, don't mention this when they talk about Matthew 24. Now, maybe uh, Elder Wee will include this in his teaching. <laughs> All right. Jesus was talking to the Israelites, especially the religious leaders of Israel, and he was rebuking them. It was a bad time for them. Jesus was giving them a bad time, and they, no wonder they wanted to kill him. By the way, I'm not supposed to exceed these two red lines. Huh? This is a safe zone. And my, my, two, my grandson would say, yeah, yeah, that is the lava. This is lava. You step on it, you get burned. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> so I, I can't be a moving pastor or preacher today. I have to keep within my limits. Um, largely because the monkey on the, on the camera wants to see me. <laughs> the, the, the camera that is broadcasting to the people online. All right. So Jesus, in this case, was talking about uh, uh, the, the terrible things the Israelites have been doing all this time throughout the Old Testament up to today, up to his time. He says, you know, I'm, I'm pronouncing war on you, you hypocrites. You religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, you are teaching wrong th uh, teachings. You are a generation of vipers. Wow. I'm, I, uh, oh boy. If somebody would stand up here and tell you all, you are a generation of vipers, what would you do? Boy, <laughs> I don't know. Elder Wee will be the first one to react, I think. He will come with his big stick. And... All right. And Jesus says, I send you prophets, teachers, you persecute them. And he cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather you as a hand would gather the chicks. But you kill my prophets, you stone my messengers. Israel would be desolate. That is the context within which the disciples ask the question. Tell us, when will Israel be desolate? When are these things going to happen? Yeah. And then, what will be the sign, one sign of your coming? Jesus replied, Take heed that no one deceives you. Why? Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive, not just CMC, but many. Many. Three points together from here. Yeah? Yeah. But before that, after saying this verse, in verse 6 to 10, 
Jesus mentioned all those things that will happen. Wars and rumors of wars, famines, diseases, disasters, terrible things that we are experiencing today. Right now, these things are happening. And we can see it very clearly. We are experiencing it. Then, after enumerating all these things, these events that are going to happen, that are happening today, Jesus brings back what he said in the beginning, in verse 11. Then, in the confusion of all, I like this, the, the, the interpretation by the message. You know, to me, Bible versions are not translations. They are interpretations by the authors. Yeah. Okay, you can disagree with that. That's fine. It wouldn't affect your salvation. Yeah. But in the message, as well as in the New King James Version, it says, then, very important, one single four-letter word. Okay? He says, then, that means, after what I have said, then, this will happen. In the confusion, in the, the message interpretation is, in all that confusion of the wars, famines, diseases and disasters, false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Why did Jesus do that? He did not first mention all the other wars, uh, rumors of wars, pestilences and disease and disasters, but he first mentioned, do not be deceived. False prophets and teachings will arise. And then after enumerating all those things that are going to happen, he says, then in the midst of all these things, don't forget, false prophets and teachers, teachers will arise and many will deceive, be deceived, apostasy. Apostasy. Many, the three points I mentioned, many will come, especially in the last days. Yes, they've had false prophets even from the Old Testament days. But when these things happen, then there will be an increase in intensity of false prophets and false teachers and teachings. Secondly, they will come in Christ's name. What did Jesus mean by that? It meant that they will come from within the church. The church has succeeded to, 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 to defend against all the attacks of the enemy from outside. Even the atheists, you know, you, you, you see so many conferences and debates about uh, theological debates and all that, and even uh, from people of other religions. We have defended successfully. But the most dangerous thing is these things will come from within within the church. Somebody has said that the fall of most strong empires is not the result of external attack by the enemies, but by the result of internal strife, corruption, and decay. The, the, the work of the enemy does not change. He's, he's got it's the same tactics, same strategies right from the Garden of Eden. And he's going to do it from within the church. Jesus knew that it was going to happen. Even the scriptures uh, tell us about this. Many will be deceived because it is coming from within the church. If it's from outside, we say, ah, oh, no, 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 that's the enemy. We, we, we don't believe that. We, 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 we will fight against it. You know? But when it comes from within you will unconsciously or even not realizing it accept the attack of the enemy. Second Peter 2 1 says what? But there were also false prophets in Israel. Yeah, in the times of Israel, just as there were false prophets, there will be false prophets, teachers among you. How will they do it? They will cleverly teach destructive heresies. And I think that is one of the most difficult things we can, for us to handle today in our churches. Beware of false prophets who come to you, Jesus says. How? In sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. We are the sheep of his pasture. So what does Jesus mean? These people will come looking like us, behaving like us, and talking like us until we are deceived. 
That's how we're going to get deceived. If they come, you know, uh, with their heresies right from the start, we can reject them. Yeah, false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Friends, these are serious warnings to us. These last days, yes, the enemy can come from outside. We can defend ourselves. But when it comes from inside, we fall prey. We fail to deceive, we fail to recognize and are deceived. Their primary target are Christians. It is not the outside world. Satan does not care for people outside the church who do not believe anyway. They're going to follow him. But his target is you and me. We are the primary targets in this last Signs of the end times. You know, Jude one four is classic. I looked at it first time and I said, I never saw it this way. It is almost a prophecy of today, written by Jude. By the way, the name of Jude is not his real name. His real name is Judah. <laughs> and but because it was so close to Judas, yeah, he decided to drop the A, <laughs> and it's got he replaced it with an E. So he's Jude. Jude. Uh, Look at it. For certain individuals have crept in unnoticed among us. <laughs> Praise the Lord, you are here. Good to see you, brother. The, the usher would shake his hands if he could. Uh. Now they do, boom, boom, they do a punch. Hey, my one and a half year old grandson, when he sees me, he says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he, he does this. I mean, one and a half years old. He has, now that is his lifestyle. No more. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Huh. No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, boy. Life has changed. Right. They are ungodly people. Look at these words. Who distort the grace of God. The grace of God has become hyper grace. The grace of God has become superficial or wonderful grace that you can enjoy in your life today. Great deception. I mean, that word grace, I said, oh my, I never saw it that way. And these are the, I'm going to deal with just a few deceptions today. And these are all from those institutions or teachings or, or, or the churches that teach hyper grace. Okay, so go along with me because it's quite dangerous. It's affecting people. I've come across recently people who talk to me and say, hey, what do you think of this? Once safe, always safe. Uh, is, our, is, is our salvation uh, uh, eternal security? I say, yes, it is eternally secure, but, not, but according to what the Bible teaches, but not according to what you believe, what you understand. All right. Let's look at what this guy said. A.W. Tozer, most of you know, he's a great writer, a great teacher. Yeah. Uh, he writes about apostasy. And he writes it from a different perspective. And this is what we are talking about today. We often think of apostasy as falling, uh, falling away from the faith, falling, uh, being persecuted under persecution. Oh, okay, we give up the Christianity or Christian faith or, or, or having experienced something terrible and, and, and uh, being disappointed with what we thought uh, the Bible was teaching or di di being disappointed by some teachings of leaders. And we said, no, I don't want this, this Christian life anymore. Uh, we, talk about, we think of apostasy, apostasy in that way. Most of us do anyway, most of the time. But this is what we're talking about, a different perspective of apostasy today. And that is even more dangerous. A.W. Tozer talks about this underlying danger. And he wrote it in this way. So skill is error at imitating truth. That the two are constantly being mistaken for each other. That is the danger, friend. When we do not know how to discern truth from error. And that is what will hurt the church. That will hurt what will destroy the believers. Boy. And he continues to say, there are areas of Christian thought, maybe by theologians or scholars who teach, and we respect them, we look up to them. And because the thought can become your life, 
when you think about it and you accept it and you believe it, it becomes your life. Where likenesses and differences are so difficult to distinguish that we are often hard put to it to escape complete deception. Yes, be not deceived. It's a very timely, I believe, warning. Yeah, deception is real. Because I've seen and I've people in, who used to work in my office, we had lunch together, and they said, they talked to me about this. And I can sense and see and realize that these people have been deceived. Their understanding of the Word of God is only restricted to what the pastor or the teacher teaches them. And they have been deceived because they do not understand the whole Bible. Yeah. Do not look for apostles. He says, aha, this is interesting. Apostates. Apostates are those who, who teach uh, wrong teaching. Yeah? To appear bad on the outside or speak dramatic words of heresy at the outside, outset of their teaching. That means right from the start, they, they tell you wrong teaching. Straight away you do it. Ah, no. We can't accept that. We can't believe that. Yeah? But rather... What do they do? Denying the truth outright. Apostates will twist the truth to fit their agenda. Yes. Very true. I will show you how truth can become untruth. Well, what stirred me to look into this topic or this subject and this teaching is when I saw this on internet, shepherd or wolf, he was talking about Joseph Prince, but let me be clear, I'm not here to condemn anyone. I'm not here to speak against any church. No, friends. By the way, I've met people who were saved, who came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, whether in the Hokkien service, the Mandarin service, or the English service, in His church. And they, are, they come to know the Lord by the hundreds per week. I mean, not only CMC, but my church even. When we have one or two persons come forward on Sunday, oops, <laughs> uh, uh, for salvation, and they receive the Lord and say the Lord's prayer, we are so one, we are so happy, we rejoice, and we say, all heaven rejoice, hallelujah, for these two souls. My friends, his church sees and records hundreds every year, every week, who receive the Lord. So I'm not here to run down his church, I'm not here to condemn anyone. But I'm here to give us that warning. Because I, I, I believe being forewarned is to be forearmed. And we know we can arm ourselves. We can be careful. We can see and discern what is happening. Yeah, of course, we even have the bishop from the Methodist Church and the, the Presbyterian leaders asking him to be condemned and to be moved out of uh, National uh, Council of Churches in Singapore. Uh, well, that's up to them and up to the Lord. But what action are we to take when we come up against such false or deceptive teachings? Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 is an interesting verse. Hmm? Because it tells us that the fault does not lie just with the apostles or teachers or pastors who teach deceptive teachings, the fault lies with you and me also. We also have to bear that same responsibility and burden of going wrong. For a time is coming, Timothy writes, when people will no longer listen. Is it pastors or leaders? No, people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. But what will they do? They the people will follow, they choose to follow their own desires. What do I want out of Christian life? Yeah, that is what I want. Yeah. And what do we do? We look for teachers who will tell us whatever our itching ears want to hear. Uh, before this, I was uh, focusing on those last few words, you know, ears want to hear, itching ears want to hear, itching ears. Uh, if you get itching ears, you can use your cotton bud, there's no problem. But here is the emphasis is what? We decide ourselves. We are also responsible whether we are deceived or not. We decide to follow our desires and look for the people who would teach us or, or, or speak to us about things we love to hear and we will please us and suit our, our concept of what the Christian life is all about. 
Uh, somebody sent me this interesting photo in my WhatsApp recently. When you preach what they want to hear, you get a big crowd. No problem. But when you preach the truth, hmm, it's worse than here. <laughs> Look at the number of people who come to CMC <laughs> and you preach the truth. Well, praise the Lord, it's not like this. We thank God that you have people who desire to know the truth and who want to live the truth. Yeah? So it is something that we should be careful, not just of our leaders, but also ourselves. We must be careful. We are also responsible. What action should we take then? Yeah? Knowing that we are also responsible. First John 4 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit, including the guy who's talking to you now. What do you do? Yes, we must test everyone that we hear. Put them to the test to see if the spirit they have comes from God. You saw the, 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 uh, the previous verses where, this, where, where Jesus warned that these people will come, the false prophets and Jesus, will come even doing miracles and signs. Yeah, it's going to happen. It, Friends, not only God is able to do miracles, signs, uh, but Satan also, Satan also can. He, was a, he, was a, he is a fallen angel. And he has supernatural powers also. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. You remember uh, Moses when, he, when he, he, he God called him to the courts of Pharaoh? What happened? Hmm. He threw his stick down, it became snake. Pharaoh said, I can also do the same. He got his magicians to do, boom! And they produced even more snakes than Moses' one snake. Of course, you know what happened. Moses' snake ate up all the, others, the other snakes. So friends, signs and wonders, don't be deceived. First John says what? You must test them to see if the spirit they have is come from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Wow, Acts 17, 11, in the New Living Translation, it says, And the people of Berea, oh, love them, listen eagerly to Paul's message. Listening to my message today, eagerly, what, with all your attention. But, but what do they do? They search scriptures. Sorry, it seems to be going on and off. They search the scriptures. Day after day, why? You know, my, 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 my wife reads the Bible more than I do. Every time I come out, when she has finished her work in the kitchen, she's sitting there at the table with her Bible, with her Bible open, reading the Word of God and writing notes. I said, wow, I wish I could do that. <laughs> so I said, can, can, can you take over my next mess, uh, preaching with a CMC? I think you are more prepared than I am. Anyway, anyway the Bible in, in, in encourages us and instructs us to the scriptures to see if what Paul and Silas, uh, I mean, not even Jehu, but the elder Jehu or elder we, but Paul and Silas, they had to. Paul and Silas were speaking the truth. Wow, that is our responsibility, friends. Even if a great pastor or teacher, or evangelist comes and stands behind this pulpit and teaches you and you are awed by his rendition and his wonderful preaching and message, go back and test with the Word. Our basis is the Word of God. It must never, you will notice that everything I speak, almost every point has got supporting verses. Yes, I want to make sure that everything I say behind a pulpit is biblically sound. It must be founded on the Word of God. Everything. Search the Scriptures. Our responsibility is not, not even the pastors or the teachers or the prophets. Our responsibility. This is the action we need to take. So I say, know what you believe. Yes, we should know what we believe and what we don't believe. And know why. You believe what you believe. It's so important. Why do you believe what you believe? 
you know why you have Holy Communion or partake of the Lord's table? Do you know why? Well, one, that was one of the uh, uh, things I taught with my, in my church in, in, in this series. It was the first because the first thing I thought was because it was on a communion Sunday. Uh, my church has, has it only once. On. It's on or off? <laughs> okay? Yeah. So uh, I, I decided to teach on the real purpose of Holy Communion. Okay. So, yes. Uh, the words are hidden. Uh, I think be biblically sound. I think those, those are the four, three words. Biblically sound. Uh, to know why you believe what you believe. So I want to help you this morning with a few deceptions that are creeping into the church very insidiously, very dangerously. Some deceptions. This is the first one. The new covenant only begins after the cross. How many of you agree? I think many people would raise their heads and say, yes, no problem with that. New covenant is is in the New Testament, it's not in the Old Testament. And we are new covenant believers. We are covered by the grace of God. We are saved by the grace of God, rather, by through faith. Yeah, this is the new covenant. Ah, you just said it. We are saved by grace through faith. That is the new covenant. That is the characteristic of the new covenant. Not by sacrifices as in the under the law. Once you understand that, you know why you believe that we are new covenant believers. But then, let's go on. So a new covenant believes, begins after the cross. Really? That means before Jesus died on the cross, new covenant was not in in practice, or it was, it was not in effect? Let's see. Many people accept this very readily, you know. New covenant only begins after the cross. But then, when you believe this readily, it leads to this. Therefore, you cannot take what was recorded or spoken before the cross of Jesus and apply it to new covenant believers today. Um, hmm, logical. It makes some sense, although I'm not, maybe not convinced thoroughly. But after believing that the new covenant begins after the cross, this makes, this makes sense. Second part. And then it leads on to this. So we need to divide the word of truth. What, what is the word of truth? Most people say it's the word of truth, the, the Bible, the, 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 the canon, uh, canon of the Bible. It means separating what belongs to the old covenant of law and what belongs to the new covenant of grace. Ah, these are not my words. Ah. These are the words of the people who wrote this book. The church of believers today has replaced Israel in God's plan for mankind. You say that, now Jehu will come and kill you, no? <laughs> I think even God will send lightning. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. The communion table is the healing table. It is the deliverance table. It's the confession table. Uh, what about what about Jesus saying about you know uh, my 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 the new covenant of my blood? I'm going to die for this. What about you know uh, making it known to the rest of the world till he comes? I, I touched on that the last part actually. In my church, but I won't touch on that today. Although it is communion day, maybe you should have. Anyway, I'm going to touch on the, the first four, yeah, and how it leads on for us to come become deceived by false teaching. All right, deception says what? The new covenant only begins after the cross, yeah, but it continues in this guy's book in page 92, when the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. So now he has confused himself already. Straight away in that one sentence. Is it after the cross when Jesus had died and then resurrected? Or is it when the Holy Spirit was given? You see, some, sometimes uh, these people, they trip on themselves. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so, you know, straight away, uh, that first part, mm, okay. But the second part, con combining the two ideas, I think you have got it all mixed up. So the false teaching here is, 
you can't simply, he says, uh, the author says, you can't simply, it's not me, the author saying this in another book, Grace Revolution, in page 309. He says, you can't simply take something that was recorded and spoken during the dispensation of the law, that is the Old Testament or, or Old Covenant, and apply it to New Covenant believers like you and me today. Oh, see, even the, even the baby is angry. He is objecting to this. Say, nah, this is false. Okay. Likewise, you cannot take what was recorded and spoken. So he continues the idea, the, the, the logic, you know, the, the argument. Likewise, you cannot take what was recorded and spoken before the cross of Jesus and apply it to new covenant believers today. Wow. Now we're getting, we're getting into dangerous ground. Right? But we were led from that part, first part. Covenant, new covenant is after the cross, yeah. But we were led to now to, to think further that this false teaching means that we cannot take what was recorded in the law to apply to what we have today under grace. Okay. The basis for this deceptive and wrongly interpreted, whether it is exegetically or hermeneutically, it is wrong. It is out of context completely. Completely. And that's the problem, you know, when you do not know the Word of God and it's preached from your word, from the preach, uh, from, uh, from the pulpit out of context. You say, Ha, huh, I never saw it that way, eh? Pastor, wow, you are so anointed. You're teaching something I've never known in my 30 years of Christian life. Why in the 30 years of Christian life you never open your Bible often enough? You never ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Jesus says, the greatest teacher is your pastor. The greatest teacher is the Holy Spirit who will teach you all things you need to know and understand. Friends, I found that to be so, so true. The Lord has revealed and taught me so many things out of all my studies, out of all my attending of classes and Bible school and all that. I said, wow, Holy Spirit, you are who you are, as promised by Jesus. Yes. But this one was completely taken out of context. Be diligent to present yourself, approve to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Doing what? Rightly potong. Rightly dividing the word of truth. What is the word of truth? The Bible. Huh? So we have to divide the Bible now. So the writer explains this. In his book, Destined to Reign, on page 51, he says, He, that means the writer of uh, 2 Timothy, writing to, Paul, uh, writing to Timothy, Paul says, he, Paul wants us to be astute in rightly dividing and clearly separating what belongs to the old covenant of law and what belongs to the new covenant of grace for you and me. You see how he has developed his thought and he does not appear initially to, get, to do anything or say anything bad or wrong or misleading. But slowly, he twists and turns the grace of God yeah, into his own, to fit his own agenda. Separating what belongs to the old covenant. Eh, if you have en know anything about the Word of God, you will know that what he has said in the first part, which seems to be truth, is slowly leading to half truth, and it will extrapolate completely when you are caught and deceived into untruth, and your life will be led by untruth. Oh, you know what? Uh, what this untruth will be will will will, will uh, uh, mean when you believe this? This just just one idea. This one idea of false teaching. I'll show you. Now the actual context of. 2 Timothy 2.15, of course, is this. was written in uh, 65, 67 AD to Timothy, a young pastor who was rising, rising up. And, and, and Paul was his like, mentor, you know. And uh, 65, 67 AD, did you say? There was no Bible at that time. So what is Paul talking about? Paul is not talking about dividing a book that did not exist. No, friends. The Bible did not come into being until about the 4th century AD, when the canon of the Bible was decided. 
This was way, way before the Bible. It really means here, work hard. That is the version, King James Version says. Work hard so you can present yourself to God. He's teaching this new pastor, you mustn't be lazy. You must study hard, intensely into the Word of God. Receive His approval. Be a good worker among your people. One who does not do be ashamed. Ashamed of what? But who can correctly explain the Word of Truth. Whatever he has learned, whatever he has received from the apostles, whatever he has learned, understood about what Jesus taught, that is what he has to be working hard at to understand and to explain to his people. That is the true context of this verse. Not dividing a book that did not exist. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. No. And I show you this Old Covenant, New Covenant idea is a bit mm, misunderstood also. Why? Because God is only one way, one plan. The Amplified Version again says what? Accurately handling and skillfully de- teaching, rightly dividing, rightly handling, laying out the truth. This is other, these are the other interpretations of that word, dividing the truth. Okay, let's go on. So what does it mean when you teach whatever our lives, how to live up? today is based only on what Jesus has taught us and what the Bible has revealed to us after the cross. You know, Jesus did not teach very much after the cross. Most of his teachings, examples, miracles were taught before the cross. After the cross, not much. Yes, the Bible says he continued to expound, expand on the teaching of the kingdom of God. But after that, after the Gospels, what do you have? Acts of the Apostles. And then, Epistles of the Apostles, right? Written by the other Apostles. So you will find that most hyper-grace teachers emphasize a lot on the Epistles rather than the Gospels. Why? Because they said, New covenant believers only need to live what is taught after the cross. Is this true? What does it mean if you start living after the cross? Start living things that are taught after the cross. This is what will happen. We can disregard everything that Jesus taught before the cross. Hmm. All the parables, the lessons of the kingdom of God can be disregarded. They don't apply to us if you believe that new covenant believers need to live only by what is taught after the cross. That we, can, we are no longer the salt and light of the earth in Matthew 51. It was never mentioned again in after the cross. But Jesus says, we are to influence the world. It's because of us that the blessing of God comes into this world. It's because of us that this world is being preserved. Lord God, will love God with all your heart, your soul and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Eh... Paul never, Paul never said those words. Jesus did, before the cross. And I will show you that Jesus was quoting the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. Yeah? Forgive others as our fathers. No, I don't have to forgive. One, nah. That is before the cross. You heard me. Uh, huh? You just wait until one day. Uh. I will not forgive you. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things from God you will receive. He said, no, God, I want to receive what I want. If I receive what I want, I will seek your kingdom. Whew. Friends, I come across Christians within inverted commas like that. A few years later, I meet him at McDonald's, I might not, not McDonald's. Is it McDonald's? McDonald's are burger, burger King. One of those burger things. <laughs> and he was sitting there and he saw me. Hey, Alan, come, 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 join me. I sat with him. And he turned around and told me, Hey, I, are you still with that, with that Christian stuff? I looked at him. Oh, what do you mean by Christian stuff? You were at one point behind a pulpit, right? Talking about Jesus Christ and all, the Bible. 
Nah lah, all that rubbish lah. I never get what I want. <laughs> yeah. You teach hyper grace. You teach new covenant believers to only follow what is after the cross. You end up with believers like this who are deceived, who are disillusioned, and who fall away the apostasy. Apostasy. All right. Even the great commission that we have received by Jesus Christ just before he rose back up to heaven, what did he say? And this was after the cross, huh? It disproves this idea that new Christian, new covenant Christians need, need to obey only after the cross. What is taught after the cross? Matthew 28 90, as well as Mark chapter 16, what does it say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then. Teach these new disciples to obey only what is taught after the cross. All the commandments I have given you, Jesus said, including what I taught you and showed you and explained to you before I was crucified. All the commandments. The Holy Spirit, ah, what did Jesus say? Huh? I just mentioned it just now. Yes, and the Holy Spirit will come after the cross. Yes, He will teach us all things. Everything. And reminds us of what? Everything Jesus taught before the cross. So this deception is, although, you know, if you know your Bible, if you know your Word of God, and you understand, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, we, we, connect, we, we, we can reject it. Way. But many people have been deceived. Yes. Many people. How, why do you think they have thousands of people coming to some hyper-grace church? Huh? John 14, 26. When Jesus says this, I like John 14, 15 and 16. Some of the, my favorite portions of scripture. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, what will He do? He will teach you some things that you need to know. No, no, no. He will teach you all things and remind you of some things. No, no. Everything I have said. Wow. Jesus is saying this. He will remind you. Everything I have said is from me, from God Himself. Because we have a covenant-keeping God. And His Word never changes. Remember that verse? Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall never pass away. And that includes what was recorded in Genesis right up to what you're going to learn from, from Elder Wee in, 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 in Revelation. What does it mean? Psalms 89.34, these three verses I'll give it to you. I will not break my covenant. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the Lord was speaking to, uh, to David. Deuteronomy 7, 9, when uh, the Lord spoke to Moses, understand therefore that the Lord your God is indeed God. God, He doesn't, He does, He does not lie. God is not man that He should lie. Not, not the son of man that He should change His mind. God is faithful, who keeps His covenant. For when? For yesterday, today, but forever. For a thousand generations and lavishes his love, unfailing love on those who love him. Love him and obey his commandments, all his commandments. Psalms 105 says he remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. So we have a covenant keeping God who will never change. Yeah, the covenant he made with Abraham, his, his oath to Isaac and confirm it to Jacob is applicable to us even today. That's why I also teach the Ten Commandments. I'll show you why. I'll show you why. Certain people or, or, or to threaten them. No, friends. But to show the love of God. And it's a wonderful plan for us. It's the Ten Commandments. Anyway, the, I chose seven major covenants in the Bible. I will not go through them with you because we do not have the time. Yeah? We're supposed to finish at 12.30. You know? And I asked uh, Sister Flo, uh, my, 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 my message, two hours, enough or not? She said, ah, so short, ah, she said. So bless you, Elder we and all the Elder Board for being able to sit through long. You know, once I was invited to India, I think it was Kerala. 
And, and, and the invitation said this, Pastor, if you cannot preach for at least three hours in one shot, don't come. <laughs> oh, I loved it. I loved it, Pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, when I go to uh, those remote areas where people walk days, literally days, to come to the meeting place, four days they, they, they trek through the jungle and they sit down and listen to you. They sit on logs, not comfortable cushion chairs like ours, you know. On logs with no backing support. You want to speak to them in one, two hours? Friends, no. They will sit through with you throughout the day, the whole day. And after you're finished, uh, summer tomorrow? Wonderful. Hallelujah. Okay. So we have here a God who has given us many covenants. And why, why I just want to go through this is because uh, uh, this is the same God who gave us the Adamic covenant with, in, in the Garden of Eden, yeah? And then he also gave this, this covenant to Noah, yeah, promising never to destroy life again, and then uh, with a flood. And then he gave a covenant to Abraham, yeah, about being a father of many nations and how the land of, of Israel, the boundaries of the land of Israel was established. And then he gave uh, uh, the, the Palestinian co uh, covenant, not to the Palestinians, uh, but the, the, the covenant that describes Palestine the restoration of the promised land, etc. And then Moses' covenant, you know that the Ten Commandments, and then it was developed and increased and expanded by the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders to more than 600 commands for sacrifices and living. And then the Davidic covenant where it amplifies God's plan through the seed of David, the coming of the Messiah. Then the new covenant when the Messiah finally comes that is mentioned in Jeremiah 31. Yeah, initially a covenant to Israel, but now it is extended to all mankind. That now this new covenant where Jesus comes as the final Lamb of God, sacrifice for our sins, we are forgiven by faith and not sacrifices. Hallelujah. So all this covenant, as you will notice, as I go on and, uh, do, do, uh, with this teaching, you will notice that it is a developing and gradually processed uh, uh, plan of God. How God started all this. Yes, we may have two testaments, but we have one Bible and one plan. God's plan. So I'm going to show you what is God's plan. Here's one plan. It began in, 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 in the, the, the Garden of Eden, yeah? Our salvation plan. Genesis 3, 5. When, when uh, God told, uh, the, well, you're going to have somebody teach you about serpent, the serpent. I wonder who he is. Maybe... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 Brother Jehu, maybe I should listen in and borrow your notes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, those told Satan, yeah, one day your head will be crushed. Only strike the heel. When you can only strike the heel of the seed of the woman. But you, Satan, your head will be crushed. What was, his, what was God talking about in the Garden of Eden? I mean, that is another how many thousand years to come. It started already, God's salvation plan. And what does it lead to? God's salvation plan will lead to our final restoration. I had a whole one-week teaching in, in the largest uh, uh, Baptist Bible school in, in Asia with more than 450 students. And I thought about restoration and revival. And the academic dean, <laughs> after that, came up to me and said, Reverend, where do you get this teaching? I said, friend, which book do you use? Who was your teacher? I raised my Bible and said, my book, same as yours. Lah. It's called B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. And my teacher it's also your teacher and my teacher. The Bible school I go to is HSBC. Hmm? <laughs> Holy Spirit Bible College la. No Hong Kong Jai Bang. Holy Spirit Bible College. And I told him, this, this Bible school is terrible, you know. Only one teacher. Day in, day out, you see the same face. 
And then you never graduate. That's the worst part. You never get a certificate. You just keep on learning. And you stand there and you keep on coming back to the light just because you love it. Hallelujah. Restoration. God is going to restore all of us to not just what He intended for us in the Garden of Eden, but even more. Hallelujah. You read Ephesians. Ephesians is supposed to be the queen of epistles written by, written by Paul. And it describes what? Ephesians 1. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us, loved us, prepared salvation for us. Yeah? And he says what? So that he would, uh, for us to be holy and without fault in his eyes. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21, Paul explains that how he who was without sin had to die and became sin so that we, and I, you and I, can be the righteousness of God, standing before God, righteous, covered by the righteousness of Christ. And what does he do that for? In verse 5, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us, every one of you here and me, adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ will do as the final Lamb of God, this final sacrifice that will meet all the demands of the law. And this is what he had wanted to do all the time, right from the beginning. And he gave God great pleasure. Hallelujah. You see, now God has one plan from Genesis right up to when Jesus comes. Hallelujah. That is one plan. So now we are not talking about Two Testaments, Old Covenant, New Covenant, whatever it is, it is all God's one plan. From Genesis to Revelation, one continuous account of how God works out His one plan to have sons and daughters with full rights, like Jesus, yes. Adam and Eve did not have this. He was, they were created in the image of God, yes, but to take care of the creation. But God said, no, I want you to rule. Not just take care. You Not know, just to be caretakers or even undertakers, but I want you to rule with me. Hallelujah. Reigning with Him with righteousness. Where? We have received that from Christ. He, Ephesians is a very powerful book. Powerful, uh, uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to understand, but when you understand the whole concept of uh, uh, Paul's teachings, and how he explained the plan of God and salvation and the teachings of Jesus. It's wonderful. Ephesians is, is a complete book, they say. All right. So we know there are 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testament, right? But look at the last two verses of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. What does it say? Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. Now, uh, Jesus began to mention and explain this, right? Why? Because the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, our religious leaders say that Elijah must come first before the Messiah comes. Ah. Look at this that verse one more time. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. Hmm. Two contrasting descriptions which probably very likely would talk about two different events. One event would be great. The other one would be dreadful. It would be great because wonderful things, happy things, joyful things happen. It would be dreadful because it would be a terrible time of judgment. Yes, great because of the coming of the Messiah who will bring about an end to the power of sin and the law, but dreadful when Jesus comes as the King of Kings to judge the world and all mankind. So before all these things happen, we are right in between now, no? actually before the great and dreadful day. The great day is on our left and the right, uh, dreadful day is on our right. We are right in between, yeah? waiting for our rapture, <laughs> our coming, our, the, the Lord taking us home. Yeah? And this is the desire of my sister, actually. She said, Lord, please take us home, take us home. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, this should be the desire of all our hearts. All right. So, the great and the full day of the Lord arrives. But Jesus explained this. 
who is this prophet Elijah? Why must he come before the Messiah? That means if Elijah hasn't come, then Jesus is not the Messiah. Hmm? Correct? Jesus explained this in Matthew chapter 17. That this Elijah represents the prophets and everything that was revealed by the prophets, the law. But this Elijah is today represented by the coming of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the coming of John the Baptist represents the coming of Elijah. Jesus' own words explain this. You don't believe me? Ask me. Yeah, fire, read your scriptures when you go home. Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 to 13. Jesus' own words. This Elijah is John the Baptist. And you will notice something that John Baptist... Now, John the Baptist was the, like the introducer, the, the one who introduces the coming of Jesus, right? Look, read the four Gospels, how John the Baptist introduced Jesus. I, I teach this about the, talk, uh, uh, about the teaching of the Holy Spirit, and most people are like, oh, it was like that, huh? Yeah. All the four Gospels, in all the four Gospels, out of the four, only one mentioned that Jesus is coming as the Lamb of God to die for our sins. The other three do not. Yes, it was essential. Yes, it was necessary. Yes, it was the final work of God when Jesus cried out, it is finished. But that was supposed to usher an even greater era of the coming of the Holy Spirit that we are enjoying today. All the four Gospels will tell you this. John the Baptist introduced Jesus as the baptizer of the Holy Ghost, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit with fire. All four Gospels. So if you're playing a football match, you got a winning score of 4-1. to one. <laughs> Okay? So, okay, back to our point. I, I, I tend to sidetrack a bit here and there, so forgive me. Okay, so Jesus said John the Baptist was the coming of Elijah. And to prove that he is the Messiah. All right. So the New Testament, so we have here a 400 years thing. And then Michael saying the coming of uh, uh, Elijah. And then when did Elijah come? How many of you have read Matthew chapter 1 with great joy? <laughs> uh, thank you for laughing, like, like the brother. <laughs> I, I was like, I was, <laughs> I said, what on earth? Yeah. You're giving me a, 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 a family tree of, of how, how many hundred years, a thousand years, you know, from Abraham right up to Jesus. But do you notice one thing? Every, the, the whole genealogy from Abraham to Jesus was divided into three 14 year generations. 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, then Jesus comes. Very interesting. We serve a very, very, very uh, orderly God, you know. Yeah, that's why even in the, in, the, in the exercise of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, God is a God of order. Yeah, all right. Uh, so we have here uh, verses 1 to 15, 42 generations of men mentioned from Abraham of uh, Israel to uh, the patriarch of Israel to the birth of Jesus. Then suddenly a woman is introduced. The Messiah is coming from a woman. Why? You see, the man was a father of other men. As you know, when I first read Genesis, uh, Matthew chapter one, I said, uh, "This guy beget this guy. Hey, how can men give birth to this man?" <laughs> then I get to look. The word "beget" means to father or to produce out of your line, yeah, somebody else. So do you produce another line? All right. So the seed of man carried the seed of Abraham's, uh, Adam's sin. That's why we have that verse, all have sinned. The sin of Adam has been passed down from generation to generation, to all nations, to all races, to the seed of man. So man, don't think so great of yourself. Huh? You carry the, seed of, the sin of Adam. Yeah? 
So everyone was born. So, but the Lamb of God had, was needed to be born without the seed of sin. So that's where man is more removed from the picture. And God says the Lamb of God is without blemish, without sin, yet fully representing mankind to be the propitiation of our sins. I always explain this to my, uh, my, my church. Propitiation has got two different meanings in, in the Bible. It has, first, the, 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 the idea of redeeming sacrifice, which Jesus did and paid for all sin, the penalty of our sins. And then it, the second part, the propitiation, is to restore us to once more the relationship with God, our Father. Yeah. That's why every now and then I hear uh, 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 Sister Flo preach, uh, speak or, 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 or pray, she will say, Abba, Father. She will say, Abba, Daddy, or something like that. I always say, Father. She, well, she's closer. Lah. So the woman is closer. <laughs> okay. So that's why Mary had to be born. Uh, Mary had to be the one chosen without sin, without having consu consummated the relationship with, G uh, with Joseph. She was to be without sin. The Messiah had to be born of a woman because he had to be without sin. He, if he was born of a woman who had consummated with Joseph, he would be also inheriting the sin of Adam. Okay, so that's it. Now, the New Testament genealogy, why, why, oh why, did, did that chapter 1 of Matthew was there to bore us to death? No. To provide continuity. It's very essential. God used Matthew to do this to show us that there is continuity in His plan. Ever since the starting of the nation of Israel through Abraham, there was one plan of salvation that God said to save and restore us right to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Even Moses anticipated this. Yeah? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 5 and 6, yeah, and, and he was writing about what the Lord revealed to him. And the Lord your God, uh, in verse 6, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. He, he didn't even mention about the sacrifices they, they had to do, you know. Moses was looking forward to that time of grace, the new covenant of grace, when God said you are to love your God, not with sacrifices, but with all your heart and with all your soul. Wow, that is a little change. The Israelites up to the time of, of, of Malachi and uh, uh, before the coming of Jesus, they had to do sacrifices, so many kinds of sacrifices for different kinds of sins. And that was how they found that they could stand before God. Not exactly righteous, but just unpunished. <laughs> uh, they had the mercy of God. Uh, people say the mercy of God is uh, not receiving something that we deserve. But the grace of God is receiving something that we don't deserve. Okay. To love the Lord your God. Will... Now, who said these words also later on in the New Testament? Compare this with what Jesus says in Matthew 22. Yeah, when the Pharisees and Jesus, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees challenged Jesus, one of them said, an expert in the law. Any lawyers here? Oh, good. <laughs> he said, Teacher, show us which is the most important commandment. Where? The law of Moses. Yes, they were still living in the law of Moses, the law of the old uh, covenant. But they said, Out of all this, which is the most important? Then Jesus took the law of Moses and said, Look, that wasn't just the law then, in your time. But Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. What was recorded in Deuteronomy. And Jesus continued to expand and say, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he concluded this, which is mind-boggling. He says, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets, that means the old covenant of the law, are based on these two commandments now because they are going to be the covenant of grace, the new covenant, which is actually 
the continuation or the fulfillment of the old covenant. Yeah, the entire law and demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. You know, if you look at the ten commandments, they are based. They are divided into two major parts. The first part is your relationship, man's relationship with God. The second part is our relationship with one another. And Jesus is saying this: If you love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, this whole law is fulfilled. Everything is fulfilled, and that is what I have come to do. Yeah. And Jesus, okay, uh, good. Go through the verses very quickly. Uh, Jeremiah mentioned this about looking forward to the new covenant, yeah, where the law of God will be written in the hearts of the people. And then Ezekiel also, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Yes, coming of the Spirit of God. Before the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not given to the hearts of men, to the lives of people. But when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon all flesh. New spirit. I will remove from your heart a stone and I will put my spirit in you. That is a new, test, new covenant. And move you, what? To follow my decrees, how? By offering sacrifices, by obeying laws that are written in the book, but be careful to keep my laws according to my spirit. Hallelujah. Okay, so that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I have come to accomplish their purpose. Yes. Old covenant law, new covenant grace is a continuation, an accomplishment of what the old covenant was about. What? So what is the purpose of the law? Why, did, why didn't God just give us a new covenant first? Why was the law first given? God gave the law for the purpose that man would have knowledge of sin. Without the law, man would not know whether what he did was pleasing to God or against his law or uh, disobedient to God. And to recognize what? Our need for somebody who can save us. Somebody who can save us from our sin. The law was given to bring us to the end of ourselves. But we consider in despair that we can't attain the holiness that God expects. That would lead us to see our need for a saviour, for Jesus. That's the purpose of the law. God gave us the law so that we can receive the salvation and the grace that Jesus provides. Romans 3.23 therefore explains this to us. That is why, for, it explains, because of all this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I, I think I don't want to go into this, <clears throat> the preceding, <coughs> context because it will take too long. If you read uh, the chapter three, verse twenty to twenty-two, you will see how uh, Paul explains that the law brings us to the consciousness of our sin, and apart from the law, we cannot be justified. We are only justified by His grace. All right. So I, I will put this in two sentences. You may have seen this somewhere before. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Yes. New Testament is the Old Testament. Reveal. Amen. But it is the same thing. It is the plan of God. That God has only one plan. God has one plan for mankind. He never changes. He develops His plan in a progressive way. Administering all this plan, His plan through reinforcing covenant. I showed you the seven covenants. Yeah. Each covenant, each new covenant reinforces the old one. It does not abolish or make obsolete the old one. But it reinforces and strengthens. That's why Jesus says, finally when he died on the cross, he says, okay, it's finished. I've done it. Amen. Hallelujah. It is finished. What is finished? Sin is finished. The law is finished. Now we have grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friends, sin has been conquered. You and I are no longer controlled and powered by sin. We have overcome sin. We have the ability to overcome sin if we wish to. Yeah. It's not, it's not the same with people who do not know Jesus, you know. Many of them, or all of them, do not have that power to overcome sin. All right. 
That's why Jesus says, it is finished. I like to preach this on, uh, on uh, Good Friday. Uh, so how does God develop His plan progressively? When I mentioned that, you know, uh, one covenant uh, develops from, to, from uh, the previous covenant and becomes uh, uh, even greater. In dispensations, I will go through this very, very quickly, okay? I do not do not want to waste our time. Divine demonstration, what is the, this dispensation? It is the divine administration of a period of time, how God works at different times throughout human history. God works differently, you know. He's the same God. We are the same people. But what we are, who we are at that time, God works with us progressively. He's a good God. You do not, you do not teach a one-year-old child, uh, you know, the English alphabet or the Chinese words, you know. You talk to him verbally, and he hears sounds and he repeats sounds. And as he grows older, at the age of three, probably, he can, he can see letters and numbers. My, my granddaughter is a, is a classic example. She can, she's three years old, but she can speak to you in full English sentences. But you ask her to speak in Chinese, she says, no, I don't want. Oh boy, <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> okay, so God develops this in dispensations. God reveals Himself progressively to man. I put it in this way. In Genesis, the whole Trinity was revealed in, during creation. Yeah? In all, the Old Testament, God revealed Himself mainly, largely as the Father of mankind. One God. Why? Because He was revealing uh, Himself through the nation of Israel. And the, the nation of Israel was surrounded by nations who, who worshipped many gods. And so he had to use Israel as one nation that, 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 that uh, worshipped one God and he did not want to uh, confuse the people. <laughs> the, the minds and the hearts of the people were not ready yet for, for a holy trinity, which we know now. Uh, so God revealed himself as the Father, God the Father. And then when Jesus came, he revealed God the Son. Jesus said, what in John, in John 14, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So it was the same. It's the same God who's now revealing Himself not only as God the Father, now as God the Son. And when Jesus returned, He said, I will send my Spirit. And now today, God is revealing Himself as God the Holy Spirit. You see how God is dispensing to us, planning His plan progressively, developing. Yeah, so we have the first two dispensations are the God's law. The next two dispensations, gospel and the Holy Spirit, is the dispensation of God's grace, also known as the new covenant. Okay, so the, when did the new covenant really begin? These are the words of John the Baptist. He says, the promise, the time promised by God has come at last. He, John the Baptist, announced, the kingdom of God is near, repent of your sins and sacrifice. No, he said, believe the good news. So he's changed now. Time of, from the very time of John the Baptist, he says, now your salvation, your forgiveness, your repentance depends on belief, faith, and the good news. Matthew 11, 13, Jesus says, for before John came, all the prophets and the law of Moses look forward to this present time. So he says, before the John the Baptist came, the Elijah which was promised in, 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 in uh, the last book of, of, of the Old Testament, yeah, they were all looking, they were under the law of the prophets, the covenant of the law. But until now, the present time, Jesus announced, yeah, the messages of the prophets were their guides until before John the Baptist. But not that now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. I, I, I like the words which Jehu used just now. You know, we have a rush, people are rushing in to into the kingdom because now it is by grace and not by sacrifices anymore. If it was by sacrifices, the, the church will become very rich, you know. Every time you sacrifice, your sacrifice, how much? $10? Mm. Only in these few sins will be forgiven. Sacrifice, $100? Okay, more sins will be forgiven. Oh, wow. All right. So the, what is the outcome, the, the result of the new covenant? Church of believers does not replace Israel. Praise <laughs> But now we are united as one man, as mentioned in Ephesians. And Paul mentions this repeatedly in his epistles. We are one man now, the new man, the new creation of God. All things have passed away. Yes, Ephesians 2. God used, uh, we were outsiders, but now we have been united. Yeah? Jews and Gentiles by creating himself one new people. 
So now the Gentiles are citizens along with all God's holy people. We are members of God's family, all of us. Hallelujah. I think we got in the easy way. <laughs> the Israelites got in the hard way. Huh? <laughs> That's why six million of them had to be wiped out in World War II. Oh boy, that was terrible. All right. <clears throat> Romans 11, 1, uh, verse, these few verses. I ask then, has God rejected his No. God has not rejected his own people. If the people of Israel, yes, there's still hope. Turn from their unbelief. They will be grafted in again. That is the context of verse 26. So all Israel will be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is hope for anyone, including terrible Israel. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know that, that the, I believe anyway. Huh? The UK, you do not have to believe with me. The, 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 the seven years of tribulation was largely meant for Israel to bring them back to, 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 to receive the Lord as Messiah. Okay, as spiritual children of Israel, therefore, we as believers inherit everything that God promised to Abraham and his descendants. Yeah? i ask you again. Yeah? Because you believe the message you have heard of Christ, we, we, we inherit all these things. In the same way, in verse 6, Abraham believed God. Yes. Because of his belief, not because he wanted to sacrifice his son, you know. But because Abraham believed, this was counted as righteousness because of his faith. The children of Abraham, therefore, are those who put their faith in God. Do you have faith in God? That is all he needs. Don't have to sacrifice. Don't even have to put $10 in the box afterwards. You can put a lot more because you have, you have received grace, you know. This grace is so much more than what the law promised. People talk, ask me to talk about, uh, what do you call it, tithing. And usually the pastor don't ask you to talk about tithing. <laughs> uh, it is usually one of the elders or somebody, leaders, hey, can you speak about tithing? I say, sure. Because I don't believe in tithing. <gasps> you know that? I have to pay the pastor. How to pay our rent? Friends, tithing means 10%, you know. I'm asking you to give much more. You're, not, no, you're now above the law. Grace is much more valuable than the law. It's 10%. Your grace, I'm sure, is more than just 10%. 10% may be the starting point. But how much do you love the Lord? Express your love. Okay, throughout the four Gospels, before the cross, Jesus healed. Uh, Jesus exercised and lived out the new covenant even before he was crucified. Even before the coming of the Holy Spirit, yeah, he, did, he decided everything, uh, whatever salvation, forgiveness of sin, healing, was all done by faith, exercised by the recipients of his blessings. You look at all the, the, the examples, uh, I'm going to go through this very fast. Your faith has made you whole. Jesus said that too. The woman with the issue of blood in Matthew chapter 9. Luke chapter 17. Ten lepers, only one were healed, but only one Samaritan returned. Ah. The, others, the other lepers were, were... Yeah. But Jesus says what? Your faith has made you whole. Then Jesus said to the centurion, who was he? He was a Gentile. Who came and believed for the Lord. Uh, he believed on, 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 uh, that, the God, that the Lord can heal his servant who was far, far away. Jesus says, go. Let it be done just as you have sacrificed. No, just as you have believed it would be done. Yes. So Matthew 99, 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, your sins are forgiven. No sacrifices needed. Ezekiel was a classic example of salvation. You know who he was, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like Zacchaeus, you know. I have to climb the, the, the sycamore tree to see Jesus. Yeah. But when, Je when he invited Jesus to his house and, he, and he, he repented of all that he has done and he, was, he said, I will return four times what I unjustly took from people. How did Jesus respond to his repentance, to his faith, to his belief, to Zacchaeus' belief? Salvation has come to this house. Hallelujah. So it wasn't a matter of the law, sacrificing under the law, but it's a matter of belief, repentance, 
And Jesus says, salvation is yours. So the new covenant was already in place before Jesus was sacrificed. Before Jesus even died on the cross, He was exercising and practicing and put into effect the new covenant. God was in Christ. So friends, God was in Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, huh, doing all those things. So you mean what God did before the cross is not important? Not relevant to us today? <laughs> mm. Makes my toe laugh. It says, okay, God was in Christ. God was in Christ. Where he was the one teaching and reconciling the world to himself. Surely God's work through Christ will always be relevant. Jesus said in Matthew 25, heaven and earth will not pass away. Yeah, will pass away. Yeah, but my words will never pass. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier. So let us today go into the word, understand God's perfect plan from Genesis right up to Revelation even. Be not deceived by false teachings. This is one of the most dangerous ones, which is creeping into not just that one big church I was telling you about, but other churches, even mainline churches. I've met people from mainline churches and they tell me, hey, what do you think of this? Huh? That means they've considered this false teaching. The new covenant only begins after the cross? No, 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 no. Be not deceived. Know what you believe. And know why you believe what you believe. Okay. So it's more important for us. When a church organizes Bible study, go. Go. The last two years, my church has been on one theme only, deeper in God. Deeper in God. Because we saw and we realized the warning of Christ. First thing He said, be not deceived. People will come with false teaching. So we need to go deeper in our relationship with God. We need to go deeper in our understanding and knowledge of the Word. Everything we believe, everything we live out, everything we think must be based on this. The Word of God. The revealed Word of God. Yes, friends. Know why you believe what you believe. So, be biblically, be biblically sound in your thinking. I have a teaching on, on a series on uh, biblical worldview. That is a very big teaching. People are like, wow, I never knew that was the way I was supposed to believe and think and, and, and live. Yes, your thought becomes your life. Father, I thank you for your word. Because of your revealed word, we are able to know the truth. And the truth shall make us free. And Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit you have given to teach us the truth that we shall know and understand your desire, your heart's desire, your plan from beginning to end that we shall be ready even in these confusing times as, as false teachers and false teachings and doctrines arise. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved because we know your word because we know what you have taught us and because we have your Holy Spirit in us to lead us, guide us and teach us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.